Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about programs that support underserved children and youth with guests. Eric Gurna, President and CEO of LA's Best After School Enrichment Program. Seema Ray James, Interim President and CEO of the National Black Child Development Institute. And Lupi Quinteros Grady, CEO of the Latin American Youth Center. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, attendees. And guests, it is so wonderful to talk about children in America. They are America's future. Um, and so many are underserved. Let's, let's really get down to, to basics. You know, it's, it's wonderful uh, that we have this amazing, amazing resource to our families, to our countries, uh, to our country. Um, we love children, but do we really take care of all children in America the way they should be? Let's, let's go around the table. Uh, Eric, let's start with you, and then uh, we'll get to you, uh, Lupi, and then um, uh, Simere. Um, Eric, how do you see America's approach to children and, and how your organization is trying to fill a gap that we Americans have left in our system? Well, thank you, Mark, uh, for the question, and thanks for having me on. Um, I mean, how I see America's approach to children is the same as America's approach to most everything else, which is that it's, um, you know, fraught with gigantic gaps in equity, um, that it's uh, the, the way we approach caring for children is based on how much we, as a society, often value their parents. In, in, and usually that comes down to where they are in the socioeconomic strata. Um, I would say in terms of how programs like LA's Best um, help to fill the gap, you know, we're an after school program. We're in uh, 200 elementary schools serving 25,000 children in Los Angeles. That's in normal times. I'm sure we'll talk about what we're doing in COVID, but um, pre-COVID and hopefully one day again, we'll be serving those 25,000 children. And, you know, it's not anything terribly complicated. It's giving kids a place to be after school where they can be safe and engaged, where they can get a healthy meal, help with their homework and get to discover their interests, you know, whether they love art or sports or both, or um, they wanna do robotics or chess. Um, that, you know, in the after school hours, it should be a time when children get to discover who they are, get to do things they like to do, get to hang out with their friends in a safe way. And it's as simple as, you know, my belief that all children should have those opportunities just like my own children do. But the reality is um, the children that LA's best serves, 90% um, of their families qualify for free and reduced lunch. And therefore they mostly don't have access to those same very basic opportunities that more affluent families have. So, you know, in the current situation with the pandemic, it, it hasn't created those, those gaps in equity, but it has um, shown the world how stark they are and it has made them even more stark. Um, and so programs like ours, I, I think, you know, I'm eager to hear about my colleagues here on the show and what they do, but I believe that programs like ours make an attempt at trying to bridge that equity gap, but we don't even get close because it's a systemic gap that will require much more than charity, much more than nonprofits filling the gap. It will, will require a systemic solution. Simone, in your, in your observation, do you uh, feel that um, children of, uh, of parents who have less means, do you feel that, that the system is, is tilted away from their success in a systemic way? Absolutely, absolutely. <clears throat> and excuse me, I'm a little bit under the weather. So thank you for your uh, initial note about making sure we take care of each other's health. Um, yes, our, our systems are not designed to create equity, to ensure that we give, and, and by equity, it's, it's a loaded word, but it's simply that every child has what they need to succeed. That if we measured ourselves on that, um, we're failing miserably. And the way that um, the way that we measure is by research and data, and the way that we collect research and data is based on how these children don't measure up to others. 
we place the onus on the families, we place the onus on the children in the way that we ask research and data questions. And that's going to drive policies that are about fixing people instead of policies that are about fixing systems that are fraught with institutional racism. That if we started to ask questions about how systems are failing and identify ways that we can improve those systems, we're, we're getting somewhere. And I see those changes being pushed for decades long. Let me not say this is you know, a, a light bulb of my own, but decades of researchers, diverse researchers really pushing for us to look at systems and stop blaming families. Um, I see there's more attention. I see there's more traction there. And that's really exciting. But we, we, we've got to start looking differently at, at systems. Um, I, I saw a recent article um, that uh, the executive director for the Alliance for Early Success, um, and she talked about, we look at GDP, unemployment, and the stock market as our indicators of how we're doing as a country. And we're not looking at hunger. We're not looking at safety. We're not looking at those, um, the, the core, core um, issues that impact the well-being of our children. Or ed educational accomplishment, right? I mean, that, that all children at a certain age have certain um, uh, uh, educational accomplishment that sets them up for, for their next phase in their development. How well do you learn when you're hungry? So we've got to look at also the, 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 the baseline indicators of well-being that are going to set you up for learning. You know, Simere uh, is the uh, interim president of the National Black Child Development Institute, and Lupi, you are the CEO of the Latin American Youth Center. These problems really do transcend a particular um, racial group, a particular ethnic group, a particular um, uh, geographic location, don't they? I mean, but they are also affected by geography. They are affected by uh, race and systemic racism. They are affected by language. How do you experience this issue in your community? Yeah, um, so just the Latin American Youth Center is a multi-service organization. And uh, um, so we have probably a portfolio of 45 different programs. And part of, I think, the how it's evolved over time is because we've, been, we've, we've worked towards having a holistic approach and seeing the whole child uh, the whole young person, right, coming in and meeting them where they're at to the point of what's made around systemic and just uh, the challenges that our families are already facing. And I think, you know, Eric, we had a little bit of time before everything got started about Maslow's hierarchy. We could talk about the brain development. There's there's so many things that we have to look at and poverty um, at a core where just, you know, to, I love I love what, what was stated around the systems because at the end of the day, you can't measure someone uh, that just has less to begin with and sort of expect that they would be able to catch up. And, and often, um, I think we're, we're always, uh, the nonprofit sector is always having to, because we want to be in service, having to manage and navigate, uh, for example, the philanthropy of the grants, which ask and require certain things. And, and I just bring that up because even when we were transitioning, meaning the pandemic hit, we had to have conversations around what, what the priorities would be for us. We had to navigate the conversation, lead the conversation that it would be food, it would be rental assistance, it would be laptop internet access, it would be mental health support. Right. We focus on layers of services that are not our normal, that really amped up to, you know, to, the, to, to, to be in that the priority because it wasn't going to be right away. Like we need to make sure this conversation about bridging the gap in academics where, you know, like there was, there were people having these conversations and I was scratching my head. Like, this is not new, new, new news. Right. Uh, the disparities or the, the achievement gaps have been there. And now with this compounded, that's not going to be where we're going to start the conversation. It just didn't make sense to me. And in some spaces, that's where I was very uncomfortable. Like, I'm not having this conversation. It's, it's food. It's, it's all of these things that our families right away, I, it was exposed. It was just in our face. Um, and I think, you know, what I think it did, it made, it made many people uncomfortable, but it was, it was the reality there. Um, and I think for, for a lot of the nonprofit sector, 
um, that are serving in, in direct services, you're seeing that you're you're working towards mitigating so many of these uh, systems that aren't working. And so part of our job too is to really encourage young people to really understand and become more self-aware around how these systems aren't working for them and not take it as their failure. You know, oh, it's it's layers of disparity is what you're pointing out, right? It's it's that there are so many different disparities that are part of where we are today that COVID has really brought out this reality of how disparate our lives are and right. how we must uh, change how we uh, interact um, with each other and how we support each other. Um, Kenneth Kutchman asked a fantastic question. I'm going to just read it to you and, and uh, I'd love to get your reactions. He says, everybody has a kid and most people who have kids, um, everybody loves children, okay? But isn't one of the reasons that our societal response to children is not effective is because there's so many different agendas. Everybody seems to be coming from a different place. And so resources are scattered to the wind and so on. And, and how do we come together around some principles that where we can end up with a investment that is logical and deals with these disparities in a, in a very systematic way and in a very consistent way? Or, or is this just sort of the nature of a democracy where there are different visions and, and it is going to be a, a, a little messy? Eric, do you have a view on that? Well, I mean, I think it, it's, it, it, yes, it would be more efficient if we had a more collective uniform viewpoint that everyone agreed on. I, I don't think that's really necessarily gonna happen given what you just said about not only democracy, but just you know society. But I, I would actually question a little bit of that premise and I'm maybe going a little bit cynical or dark here, but um, you say everyone, you know, everyone has a kid, most people, everyone was a kid, most people have kids, most people love kids. Um, I don't know if that's true. I think that people, when people think about their own children, yes. When people think about the children that they feel connected to, um, and in some ways, you know, in some cases when they look at children that they, where they sort of see themselves, they identify with, yes, there's a certain amount of care there. But um, I don't know that everybody, that our culture, I, I shouldn't, I don't wanna say everybody because I really wanna talk about this as a systems approach and as a cultural approach. We, I don't think that we value other people's children. Um, I think that, you know, as a, as a nonprofit organization serving children, I would say my number one competitor for raising funds are high-end private schools. And the reason I say that is because the, the donors who we need to donate to LA's Best and other programs like it, um, they consistently, if you really look at the research, they're giving more to their own children's private school, donating more. I'm not talking about tuition, I'm talking about donate donations. Um, than they are to the organizations that they're affiliated with um, that are serving, quote, other people's children. And so I think that for me, what's needed is a cultural shift where we really are putting children at the center of policymaking, where, you know, if, if we took the lens of what is best for, for all children in this scenario, I, any policy, any policy at all, whether it's homelessness, housing, hunger, education, if you take the lens of what's best for other people's children, what's best for all children, you'll, be, you'll have a more progressive policy, you'll have a more humane policy, you'll have a policy that's more based on love, collective action, and um, you know, uh, a, a solidarity than, than you wouldn't you know, if, you, if you don't take that lens. And so I, I do think that having a uniform approach would be nice and we've swung back and forth quite a bit between like high stakes testing and a more holistic approach and we can talk about all of that. Um, but I think we need to really examine who we are as a culture, the history of our country and how it's built on brutality and especially built on the exploitation of, of young people. Um, and, you know, I know that that's like taking it maybe somewhere that's like a little bit rough for eight o'clock in the morning and, and we're talking about these more tangible current policy things. But I think if we don't examine that, um, that we can't get at that, that more progressive approach. That, we must uh, come to love other children as we love our own. Is that what you're saying? That, yes, thank you, Mark. Yes. We have to be willing to have a little bit less for our children in order for the collective to be better. And that's what Eric is getting at, the, the cultural issue 
is we absolutely want to make sure that home is taken care of. That's natural. Um, but to what extent do we say there may be less in each pot in order for the collective pot to have more? You know, it's interesting. We just finished a poll, Lupi, in which we asked, is, is it only up to an individual family to take care of their ch child or is it up to us all? And 100%, it's very rare um, to get 100% on anything. 100% said we must all pitch in to help um, uh, the children of family and families in need. We, when it's theoretical, we can say it. When it actually is about uh, contributing and uh, taking from our own children, our own family, and just contributing just a little bit to somebody else's, it's, it becomes much more complicated, doesn't it? I was just looking, oh, go ahead, Luby. I, just quickly, I, I saw the interview yesterday of the, um, one of the children that was one of the black children that, and well, now of course a, an elderly person, but was one of the children that integrated schools. And I thought about, this is a question that's come up in my mind. If my child were a teenager and she wanted to be a part of integrating schools back then, knowing that, that she might get hurt or killed in that process, um, would, I, would I let her? Yeah, and I, I think about community. All of us have a sense of wanting to belong and wanting to be valued, um, being seen as an asset. And often um, when we talk about children, I think that when we talk about disparities, brown and black children, um, there are disadvantages. I mean, there are studies that even come out as recently George, Georgetown had a study with black young girls, uh, you know, how they're viewed the perception uh, or sexualized at a very young age as a five-year-old compared to, you know, their, to, to Eric's point about the experience that we want our children to have to be safe to be able to develop in that space with no trauma, right? Um, and so these are the things we need to educate ourselves. And I think uh, culturally and, and, and sort of us being able to have honest conversations about what that looks like and what I think it will, and, and having a conversation about what would make our community stronger, like, and being able to have these, these authentic conversations around around that, it's a start. And I think often we're, we're guarded about these conversations and, and being honest about um, the different biases that we all may have. Um, and so I think in understanding, um, I think too, uh, sometimes the perception of certain kids are bad, you know, without really unpacking the story, it's dangerous. And I think it's done, um, you know, and, and that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's something that, you know, to, to the point of, where do you invest if you believe that's worth investing? Um, and so um, there are certain communities and we've seen this across, this is not any new news as well as far as certain communities getting less than other communities that be in position. We, we talked about that. So being able to understand why it's important to invest um, and you know, not necessarily just as us being a nonprofit sector and having after school programs or programs that are, are really looking to meet young people where they're at and creating safe spaces for them. But generally like the opportunities that we want our young people to have, all our young people to have. Um, and I think those conversations need to be had more um, so that there's a level of understanding of why they're needed. Um, and, there's a, and we all have to be willing to be uncomfortable too, to have these conversations around race our own biases and just the disparities that just to start off like this pandemic has really exposed. Well, in a way, what you're saying is that it's really essential to have these, uh, these conversations across racial boundaries. If we're all responsible for our children, children who are not mine, children who are not yours, if we're all responsible, then, and there are disparities and the disparities do align to race, very often, right? We have to talk about the responsibility that we all have to heal that disparity. We just completed a poll, very interesting. We asked once children are safe, sheltered, clothed, and fed, what are the skills that are most important? And we found that almost everybody answered social, emotional, and empathy, right? Very straight up skills. Reading, writing, and communication, very fundamental skills. 
Um, it, there was a drop off, but it still uh, got onto the board sort of executive function, time management, quality of work, attention to detail. Nobody selected specific STEAM or STEM skills, mm -hmm. right? Nobody got to the higher level, you know, older kid kind of stuff. It's all very fundamental. It's the after school stuff. It's, it's all the stuff that you're doing, right? And, and it's, it's so easy in certain respects. It doesn't take a huge amount of resource, but it does take a lot of attention, doesn't it? Yes, and I think to the funding or the grant making at different levels, federal, local, and so forth, these conversations are important because when we want to look at measures that work, we got to look at what's culturally appropriate and understand and listen to our community. So to impose and say someone is, uh, you know, and we have various programs, but we've seen where a young person might have left school at seventh grade. And when you look at the story, there's just very hard trauma there. And you're trying to re-engage them and educate them for a GED. And grants would say, you need to have that young person have a GED in six months. You're not getting to that work right away. You're getting to the social emotion, you're getting to the mental health supports that they may be open to, 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 to doing, but not right away because they're guarded because of the different challenges and hurts that they've had. And no one's really taking the time often to really ask them what has happened. And so when you start to unpack that, that's when the work can begin. And it's just more than a couple of months or it's, it's more long-term. And I'm not saying, you know, to like, you know, there, but, but referring to like, there is every young person is different. I mean, we have, if you have children, you know that your children are very different, different personalities, different things, speak to them, different interests. It's the same thing when we're doing programming. You have 200 schools there. You, not all, I'm sure all the schools have very different cultures, different sure. ways in which how things work, the approach, you could tweak things, but however, meeting that young person when they're at, like it's, it's, it's a commitment uh, to that work. Simara, you were, you were uh, expressing agreement. Yeah, I think it's, it's so important for us to think about how we, how, how we aren't so stringent in this dollar has to be attached to this change for children, that we have to be um, more thoughtful about the fact that the social emotional is the, is the foundation of how children learn, that, um, that being able to have social emotional development means that you're going to master STEM later on in life. We know that the brain loves parallel learning that seeing the light bulb come on for the, for the child next to you is going to do something for you. So I, I absolutely uh, agree with Lupi. We need, to be, we need to be willing to invest in the, the fundamentals, housing, um, hunger, and then we go to social emotional and a part of social emotional is having a strong sense of yourself and your identity. And that ties into the work that all three of us are doing. So it, it also is about uh, allowing for self-advocacy, right? In other words, um, empowering young people um, to advocate for their own needs, right? And, and giving them voice and listening. Eric, as you, as you uh, shape your programs, how do you ensure that the, the young people that you serve actually affect what you are, the experience that they have? How do you create that power shift? Because a lot of these programs can be administered in a way that kind of accentuates the powerlessness of, of the young person, the child. And, uh, you know, a young person can feel that, uh, you know, just another situation in which I'm powerless. How do you ensure that you're listening to what young people need? Well, we start by basing everything on um, a set of values. And our, our number one value that we base everything on is that nothing we do is as important as the effect that it has on a child. So as a, uh, if I'm getting hired to work in an after-school program, I'm not being told that my job is to deliver curriculum or even my job is to facilitate activities. My job is to develop positive connections with young people. My, my job is to facilitate young people developing positive connections with each other. And so if I know that that's my, fundamentally my, the success of my work is going to be judged on that, not judged on if I get through the curriculum or if I get my agenda done or, you know, if, if there's a, 
uh, academic achievement, you know, being measured, but am I creating a positive environment and am I developing positive connections? Then that's what I'm going to work towards. Um, and I mean, to answer your question a little bit more directly, we invest in staff so that they can have a different experience and they can learn how to facilitate a different kind of experience. Because most of us were, when we go to work with young people, what we know how to do is what was done to us or with us or for us. And um, so there's a certain amount of unlearning that has to happen because most of us had a pretty didactic um, experience where your success as a student was mostly based on um, grades and test scores and also compliance. You know, if you could um, sit or stand still and be quiet, and I'm using the polite way of, of framing that, right? Um, and so we do that, you know, we, we create a compliant based atmosphere if we, if we don't have a chance to reflect on that and go, oh, like, yeah, I'm okay, but imagine how much more liberated I could be if I had been, if I had had a more safe and engaging experience as a child. And that's what I wanna create for young people. And then giving staff tools to be able to do that because it's easier said than done, you know? So you have tools like, we use a program called Harmony for social emotional learning out of National University that puts tools in the hands of staff so that they actually can have something to practice, right? And it's ultimately about asking children how they feel, what they need, what they want to explore, and you know, really actively listening, and then following through, changing what you're doing based on the input you're receiving, not just giving children an experience of feeling heard, but actually changing how you operate based on that input. So you're moving beyond the everybody sits in nice rows of desks and listens to uh, to somebody thrown on in a, on a boring topic in a boring way. You're getting to the interaction and that interaction is going to change from session to session and it's going yeah, to evolve you, from year to year. You point out something really important though because there's been a movement in education to stop sitting in rows of desks, to have more stations and to have more circles. And that design is great. But if you put in the design, you change the physical setup of the classroom and you don't change how you interact with young people, then it's superficial. You know, it's like, great. Like now we can, um, we can be peaceful and remain still rather than, you know, shutting up and sitting down. But it's the same thing. <laughs> like it's still just compliance. It's just put in a more polite frame. We have to change how we actually interact and we have to change our insides as, as adults. Lupi, we're coming to the end of our time. I'm going to uh, give you a word and then uh, Simare, I'm gonna give you the last word. Um, Lupi, how do, how do you ensure that your programs are meeting the needs of children, that you're listening to their needs, you're adjusting on a consistent basis? Yeah, I, I think uh, anytime you're doing direct service and with youth, you have to be understanding uh, and willing to always learn um, and to be humble in your approach um, because you have to listen to our, our youth and our children and what they've been there. We have worked and we've developed a positive youth development curriculum that we established five years ago um, that brought all our departments together to look at uh, just basically how do you look at healthy relationships? How do you create boundaries? So really, empowering the staff because you want to make sure that we have the best practitioners that they are understanding how to do this work to the point i made earlier about our own biases we want to make sure that our own experiences aren't projected to young people we want to make sure that as we're doing this work we're intentional about the work that we're doing how we set up the programs and how we do and lastly i would say i will take myself as an example i came to the latin american youth center when i was 14 years old i did a summer youth employment it built my confidence, my self-esteem. I didn't know it at the time. Came back to the internship my junior year. 23 years later, I'm the CEO of the same organization and three years into it, 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 it this is how I kind of enter CEO with pandemics and a lot of crisis. But however, I see myself as an example of that young person that was low income, first generation, didn't know I had all those labels. As I look back, I'm like, oh, I had those labels. But just the, the doors that were open or the spaces that were created for me as a young person here, then now I, it resonates and we wanna to continue to create those spaces for other young people. And Lupi, uh, in answer to our poll, 78% of respondents uh, said that they had actually volunteered for, um, for a program like yours, which is just great. 
and I'm sure that the that the others are are looking at it. Simare, can you uh, walk us out of this of this yep. discussion, which will be ongoing uh, afterwards, uh, of course? How do we change? How do we change? My final word speaks to just what you were saying in in the poll and getting involved. That there's got to be a balance between the work to change systems to identify where our overall systems have institutional racism or need more resources to support children, a balance between that and meeting children who are in the systems that we currently have and ensuring that we support them and lift them up. We have to be doing both. And so where folks listening to this, where you can encourage your communities and your families to both and that, and to create some synergy between the work of changing systems and getting young people involved in the work to change systems and understanding their role in it, and where we can ensure that we ensure that every child believes in themselves and, and sees themselves as, as a powerful member of our society. Both are important. Get involved in the issue, talk about it, reach across and talk to somebody who isn't like you, who might have a different experience, be informed by that volunteer, add your ideas, add your expertise, serve on a board, write a check, right? Mm -hmm. Right, big check. <laughs> <laughs> it's all within our power to change, right? It just is not going to happen. It's not gonna be a light switch. It's not gonna be an event. It's gonna be a process. So let's, let, let's get cracking. Thank you all so much for your work. Eric Gurner, President and CEO of LA's Best After School Enrichment Program. Simray James, Interim President and CEO of the National Black Child Development Institute, and Lupe Quinteros Grady, CEO of the Latin American Youth Center. Thank you, attendees. Thank you uh, for those who, uh, who contributed questions and answered polls. And we'll see, you, uh, we'll see you on Thursday. That's the nonprofit report. Everyone stay safe, mask up. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.